We're going to move forward with our program tonight. Uh, uh, Doug Becky, uh, I don't think, Doug, I don't think you've been here since we moved to the new facility, right? But uh, this was in the audience. Well, listen, um, why don't you come over and take over and let me sit down? Thank, thanks for coming, folks. We appreciate it. Okay, tonight's speaker is Professor John McManus. He's the author of 14 books on military history, and I find them impossible to put down. I just need more time for reading. He earned his PhD in American history and military history from the University of Tennessee, and he served as assistant director of the Center for the Study of War and Society. There he helped oversee a project to collect the first-hand stories of American veterans of World War II. He's currently a professor of U.S. military history at Missouri University of Science and Technology, where he teaches courses on the Civil War, World War II, Vietnam, U.S. military history, and the modern American combat experience. Pretty wide ranging. <laughs> Additionally, he currently serves as the official historian of the U.S. Army 7th Infantry Regiment. This is his sixth presentation at the round table. In December, 2008, he spoke on Alamo of the Ardennes, the defense, what made the defense of Bastogne possible. 2020, uh, 2012, he spoke on September Hope, Operation Market Garden. 2014, First Infantry Division at Omaha Beach. February 2016, held before their very eyes, liberation of the concentration camps. In October 2020, he spoke on Fire and Fortitude, which won the Gilder Lehrman Prize for Military History. It was the first in his trilogy on the U.S. Army in the Pacific War. Tonight's topic is again the role of the Army in the Pacific War, Island Inferno, second in the trilogy. It deals with the fighting in 1944. Please welcome Professor McManus. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate it. Appreciate the wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to the round table. For, for inviting me to, to come up here uh, again. I, I, just, I just love being here, and it's just an honor to, to work with you all and to, to come and see you all here. Uh, I especially, of course, like to, to give a thank you to my, my dear friend of so many years, Colonel Don Patton, uh, for all your support. Um, and, uh, and just for, for, you're the reason we're all in this room in, in an immediate sense, and, and I'm glad that's being recognized, too. So thank you. Um, it was, uh, you know, giving the virtual presentation a couple of years ago was, was enjoyable, it was better than nothing, um, but it is better to be right here in this room with dress pants on, so that, that's good too. Um, <laughs> it's a lot more fun, I think, but, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, just coming here and talking with you all and getting the chance to see this auditorium, which I, I had not uh, spoken here before. My last time here, we were at Fort Snelling. So uh, thank you to, to everyone in this room for, for showing up tonight. Um, so what I want to do, as Doug had mentioned, is to kind of take you into the world of the Army in the Pacific circa 1944. Um, the, the series um, is, of course, three volumes. First one, Fire and Fortitude, covers 1941 to 43. This one focused exclusively on 1944. And then there will be a third volume next year that uh, covers 1945. So uh, where are we as 1944 dawns? Well, you know, the Army in the Pacific Theater, by that point in time, um, is, is operating over uh, just this huge expanse of, uh, of ocean and island and continent. Uh, it's about a third of the world's surface that consists of the Pacific Asia Theater in this war against Japan. And so as the year begins, You've got about 700,000 ground soldiers, and that's what I mean when I say the Army in the Pacific. I'm only focusing on Army ground soldiers, not the Army Air Forces, so that would even be more Army personnel, but this is the Army uh, you know, ground soldiers. So, uh, you know, from Oahu to Australia to Burma, um, a dizzying array of all sorts of little uh, stepping stone Pacific islands, um, you know, just a, an enormous operational theater uh, to the point where no one single commander is in control of it. And to some extent, that's a compromise between the Army and the Navy because you could understand in looking at the map why the Navy is going to say, well, you know, this is, this is our theater. Look at all that ocean. Um, and the Army isn't going anywhere without the Navy. Uh, but in the end, ground has to be taken. 
and it has to be improved upon. And, it ha and bases have to be built, especially for the burgeoning Army Air Forces, which are a huge part of the war, too. Uh, and obviously, that's where the Army Ground Forces come into it. So um, it was, I would argue, a, a expanse of geography to cover that was really unprecedented in American history. Um, and in the course of the war, more than 1.8 million American ground soldiers are going to serve in the war against Japan. About a million of them, by the way, were either stationed or went through Australia, which profound consequences for, for Australia's future development, the Australian-U.S. alliance that still is in place. But 1.8 million soldiers overall, and that was the third largest army this country had ever sent overseas to fight a war behind only, you know, the World War was one and two army in the European theater. And yet, it seemed to me as if this army was incredibly anonymous, um, that, it, that, that it was sort of just glossed over and forgotten in many respects, and yet really it is the leading dagger in the war against Japan. The army mobilized during uh, the Pacific War, 21 infantry divisions uh, in airborne, plus assorted independent uh, you know, regimental combat teams, engineer special brigades, tank battalions that really amount to about four more divisions worth of combat manpower. Um, you know, and, and of course, in addition to that, you have all the accompanying uh, service forces, support forces, which were so necessary, and there were never enough of them to support this, this vast effort. Um, and you know, by comparison, uh, the, the more famous U.S. Marine Corps mobilized six divisions, which was the largest the Marine Corps had ever been. Uh, there were about a quarter of a million Marines in, uh, in World War II, and there were six combat divisions. So it gives you a little sense of the, the scale there. Um, the size of the Army in theater dwarfed the, the Marine Corps, and yet what occurred to me, and, and I think this still exists, in popular memory, there's this sense that uh, the Marines did really almost all of the ground fighting in the war against Japan, um, and the Army really kind of focused on Europe. Well, of course, the Army was focusing on Europe, but in a way, that's the point. You have this massive war you're fighting in Europe, and to some extent in the Mediterranean, and then the Army's also involved here, you know, in, in this enormous effort. Um, another give you a little sort of contextual fact. During the entire Pacific War, the Marine Corps carried out 15 combat amphibious landings. Uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger's 8th Army alone carried out 35 in the, in the Philippines in the spring of 1935, of varying size and scale, but nonetheless, these were invasions. So my purpose in pointing all this out is not at all to denigrate the Marine Corps. Actually, it's really quite the opposite, because when you see uh, this sort of larger context, of just how few Marines there re actually were in theater, you get a sense of how the Marine Corps was punching above its weight, and of course the valor is beyond belief. But it also shows you that the Marine Corps was not designed to fight that entire war against Japan, important role though it played, that actually the Army did the vast majority of the fighting and actually much of the dying. In fact, the plurality of the dying in the war against Japan. 42,000 Army ground soldiers lost their lives in the war against Japan. That was more than any other single service that fought against the Japanese. And of course, the others paid a heavy price too. The Marines, the Navy, that was the deadliest war in the history of the United States Navy. And of course, the Army Air Forces too, and the, and the Coast Guard. Um, so even as the war began, uh, many, many thousands of these guys were, were moldering in, in graves far and wide across our map here already, and of course the dying in some ways was just beginning. So it's guys like these, uh, these are soldiers from the 7th Infantry Division fighting at the Battle of Kwajalein in, uh, in February 1944 in a close-in, bitter kind of struggle. Um, and uh, you see here soldiers from the 77th Infantry Division fighting on, uh, on Guam later that same year. Um, you know, Island Infernos is sort of their book uh, about what these guys face, about that larger context of this enormous role that the Army is playing, and also, I would argue, um, a, a, a necessity for inter-service cooperation, uh, for, for coordination uh, that had never really been done on that scale and really isn't done to the same level in Europe in a sense, where you're fighting this vast continental littoral operations, you may not, as an army commander, always have to cooperate with your naval counterparts quite as much, and certainly you're not fighting alongside the Marine Corps, typically, in the European theater either. Uh, so it's a staggeringly complex situation. Vast capabilities that the army already has by 1944, um, and it's already proven itself to depth to that. Grand strategical planning. 
um, you know, exactly which islands to invade and why, where to go, how to fight, what to take, uh, how does this fit together with what policymakers in Washington, D.C. want to do? All of those kinds of things the Army is involved in. Uh, Inter-service coordination. Diplomacy is a huge part of that, too. Diplomacy, of course, with allies. Joint operations with allies, particularly the Australians, uh, who proportionately uh, put the, the most of their population into uniform and carry really the burden of much of the ground war for the Allies in the South Pacific in 1942 and much of 1943. Uh, so you're coordinating with Allies to a great extent, um, most notably too, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, nationalist Chinese. I mean, that's a huge part of what the Army is doing as well. Logistics, I mean, for instance, you know, the Marine Corps is a leaner service. It's a combat-oriented service. There's not as much kind of logistical base point. So the Army is doing a lot of that. Uh, for the ground services in the war in the Pacific. So the quartermasters, uh, the transportation corps, all of this kind of stuff that you need, really unglamorous, but so necessary to fight this war. Engineering, the engineering side of this war is enormous, and especially the aviation engineers. When you, uh, if you ask yourself, why do they want a Pacific island, it's usually, the answer to that is usually they want an airfield there to develop an air base to, to continue operations, because air, airplanes are kind of deadly to ships by uh, World War II, or they can be. So Army aviation engineers constantly have this mission to go in and build airfields in the wake of, uh, of islands that have been taken or whatever else, or to develop ports, to develop uh, a road net, to develop uh, supply and storage areas, all of those kinds of things. And of course, in addition to the traditional combat engineering of dealing with mines um, and, and you know, using flamethrowers and all those kinds of things that you might be doing in supporting infantry and armor. Um, Intel, the Intel side of this war, how many Japanese are on that island? Uh, what kind of defenses do they have? Should we invade? What do we have? Um, should we bypass it? What's the local situation there? Intel, obviously, is a huge part of what the Army is doing. Guerrilla warfare, especially in the Philippines, where guerrillas play a primary role in the 1944 and 45 campaign, and the Army is working with them, uh, you know, in a way, Army soldiers are working with them, almost similar to what Special Forces soldiers of a later generation are going to be doing. So you're seeing that already. Medical care on a scale uh, unimaginable even a generation earlier. Um, as, I, as I'll mention more in a few moments, I mean, the Pacific War is an interspecies war, and you are dealing with disease and other medical issues every bit as much as the Japanese, and so the, you, the medical infrastructure you need in order to fight and win this war is just plain staggering. Uh, civil affairs. How do you deal with the local population? And, and, and contrary to popular belief, a lot of these Pacific Islands are not denuded of population. They're there and they're from different cultures, and so how do you figure out different cultures? How do you have cultural influence? What do you do about that in Papua New Guinea or some other uh, place on our map, you know? So uh, the Army is dealing with that. Um, mortuary affairs, accounting for the dead that I mentioned, and burying them in reasonable cemeteries where they, where they can be documented. And, and later on, of course, after the war, you have an enormous effort uh, to repatriate some of the remains back home. About 60% roughly of families elect to have them brought home. And the Army is, of course, a huge part of that. The horrifying conditions of captivity. Um, this is the last war, fortunately, in which you see mass numbers of US troops captured. Um, and most of those who were captured in the Pacific Theater were Army soldiers and Army ground soldiers, the majority of them. 37% of those who were uh, prisoners of the Japanese did not survive the experience. So if you're a, a POW in 1944, you're kind of smack dab in the middle of your horrifying, terrible POW experience at the, at the hands of the Japanese. So in that sense, as an Army soldier, you might be doing that. And of course, all the things we associate with any, with any army, the ground combat operations that are ongoing in a, a ton of these inhospitable locales around our map. And the other thing about that, the nature of the combat is changing and in a way that, uh, that, that is sort of shocking to many army leaders and to many western leaders, they are encountering an enemy that really does not observe western style rules of Geneva Convention of 1929 warfare uh, of saying, well, we're not going to shoot at medics or we're going to you know, help remove wounded from the battlefield or whatever. In fact, the Japanese are doing the opposite of that, trying to kill your medics fighting to the, to the end. Uh, it's a bare knuckles fight. And so the Americans then, especially the army, now has to figure out how do we react to that? 
Um, do we fight with no values? Uh, what do we do about that? And I would argue there's much more to be learned from the Pacific War than the European War in this sense because pretty much all of our wars since have been fought with that kind of character and the Americans have had to come to terms with their own ethical issues and, and their own kind of uh, moral choices and whatnot to, in fighting such ruthless enemies. So you definitely see that. So I don't propose to, to walk you through the Army's whole 1944 experience in the Pacific Theater. It's an enormous thing for that. Of course, you have to buy the book and read it and uh, you know I mean I, I totally recommend that seriously you'll, you'll really like that um, and I promise to sign books for you and all that as much as you want but uh, so what I want to do tonight is, is just give you a few highlights that maybe kind of illustrate the larger whole of the Army's experience in 1944 so the place to start with that I think has to be with the main character certainly he would have thought of himself as that um, Douglas MacArthur um, some would have called him sort of the Zeus of the, of the theater, and, and uh, he would not have shrunk from that description. But, uh, you know, one thing is unique about MacArthur that, that no one else can claim. He had been Army Chief of Staff before the war. I mean, that's the top position in the Army. So you usually don't go from being number one in the Army to then uh, like a field commander somewhere. But MacArthur had done so because he, he had, uh, you know, he was young, a young Chief of Staff in his early 50s. And it's like, okay, what's next? And what was next is another unique situation, which was that, uh, the Senate in 1934 had passed the Tidings-McDuffie Act uh, to transition the Philippines, which is a U.S. colony, to independence by 1946. Uh, so that meant the Philippines would have to defend itself, and so MacArthur then accepts a, an offer from an, from an old friend of his, uh, the, the new president of the Philippines, Manuel Quezon, to go to the, the country and sort of build up its armed forces in the latter half of the 1930s, which is a really tough and frustrating mission. So when World War II comes along, he's recalled to active duty, and he ends up in command. Um, you know, you, you all know about the 1941-42 Philippines campaign, I'm sure, in which is a debacle, and then he's ordered out by uh, FDR, and he says, I shall return to the Philippines and all that. Well, he's in command of a theater called the Southwest Pacific Area. Um, and he is, of course, someone who believes in himself as a person of providential destiny. Um, this is his, uh, I think it's just a wonderful description from his British liaison officer uh, to, to SWAPA. He wrote, now this is Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Wilkinson, if you're wondering. Uh, he is shrewd, selfish, proud, remote, highly strung, and vastly vain, he wrote of MacArthur. He has imagination, self-confidence, physical courage, and charm, but no humor about himself, no regard for truth, and is unaware of these defects. <laughs> I think that's so funny. I think that's so funny. <laughs> and then he says, with moral depth, he would be a great man. As it is, he is a near miss, which may be worse than a mile. Um, <laughs> And he concludes, Wilkinson does, he says, his main ambition would be to end the war as Pan-American hero in the form of Generalissimo of all Pacific theaters. And that is so true. He knows his man. Um, this is MacArthur here with some of his, uh, his, his commanders. Uh, point out here, this is uh, Steve Chamberlain, who was his very uh, competent operations officer. And then right next to him is a, a key guy who we'll talk about more in a moment, Lieutenant General Walter Kruger, who will command more ground troops in the Pacific Theater than, than anybody else and will be obviously a key player. I think it's also really interesting that over here on the edges is uh, Major General William Ruperitus of the 1st Marine Division, uh, who does not really serve under MacArthur's command for most of his career, but he will be the commander at Peleliu. Um, so, uh, so it's a mixture of people there that, that you see with him, and you see a, a common MacArthur pose just sort of looking out into the distance, as if he sees something you don't. You know? <laughs> You'll notice that, that sort of pose of him in, in many pictures, and it's, it's really quite interesting. So by early 44, um, here's where he is. He spent almost a year and a half bogged down. Um, again, you, know, you can see the larger theater, uh, what he's got to deal with, and he wants back to the Philippines. This is Swapa here. And then, of course, the rest of the theater, for the most part, is under the control of uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, who MacArthur perceives as a rival. Nimitz would have told you, well, actually, we're partners, you know, silly me, you know, we're trying to fight against the Japanese. So Nimitz is really much more even keel, and I think, in, in my opinion, more professional in his dealings. But MacArthur, too, to his credit, will uh, eventually work fairly well with Nimitz, okay? So, but, he, but as 1944 begins, what he's concerned about is that, um, you know, he's only advanced over, you know, a couple of 300 miles of uh, New Guinea wilderness up here, and he's concerned that, you know, 
as um, Nimitz's island hopping campaign proceeds, and it's really going quite well by early 1944, especially with the capture of the Marshall Islands, or key islands in the Marshalls, which accelerates his timetable by about eight to, to 12 weeks, something like that. And MacArthur's really concerned that what's going to happen is that the Washington policymakers are going to say, okay, well, um, you know, we're going to give most of the resources to Nimitz to have this sort of campaign to go straight at Tokyo, and you just kind of sit here and protect his flank, and we'll just give you sort of tertiary status. And MacArthur had been howling from the beginning of the war about how he didn't get enough support, how he didn't get enough reinforcements, how he didn't get this, that, and the other thing. Of course, by the end of our discussion tonight, you'll see that that really no longer applied, if it ever really did, that he's going to get major resources for his ground forces in particular, especially by the 1944. So he's concerned that this could happen, so he really wants to accelerate his advance. Um, and New Guinea is a huge island, and he's maybe advanced across one-third of the northern coast by, uh, by early 1944. So there's two things that happen in the first four months of that year that really accelerate MacArthur's timetable. So you see the, the North New Guinea coast. You see up here the admiralties. Um, the admiralties are important all of a sudden because if you can capture some of the key islands there, you can have excellent air bases that allow you to, have, to raid a lot of the Japanese northern controlled, uh, uh, the, the, the northern part of the New Guinea coast, and you can begin leapfrogging operations across there. And of course, MacArthur's ultimate mission, as his great quote, I shall return, indicates, is he wants back to the Philippines. In a way, he wants back to the Philippines even more than he wants to, t to Tokyo. Um, because he sees it as, as so necessary. He sees it as home. He loves the archipelago and its people, uh, and many of them love him back. Uh, and so, yes, he wants to go and liberate them, and he is fighting for that in, in uh, sort of high-level discussion. So what he wants his ammo for that is to accelerate the pace of his, his advance. So he seizes um, these quite anonymous places in the Admiralties, Los Negros and Manus, in the early months of 1944, and this is quite a bold operation. Um, it, it's really an interesting dynamic. Um, by this time, um, MacArthur had developed uh, excellent relationships with his, his naval and, uh, and Army Air Force's colleagues, uh, good working relationships. Most notably, um, Rear Admiral Ad, uh, Daniel Barbet had emerged as one of the, the sort of key experts on amphibious warfare, and he's going to serve under MacArthur's command quite a bit. Vice Admiral Tommy Kincaid and his Seventh Fleet uh, are going to, to be under MacArthur's control at times, and uh, he and Kincaid have, have, have a solid relationship. He has, uh, he has a very good relationship with Admiral William Halsey, uh, and, and MacArthur loves Halsey's aggressiveness, his, his sort of bulldog mentality, and their fathers had known each other. Uh, so there was great respect there. His air commander, uh, General George Kenney, is, is arguably one of the finest commanders of the war. And so Kenney has really turned the tables on the Japanese and started to give the Allies some level of, uh, of air superiority in theater. So Kenney is telling MacArthur, you know, there's not much Japanese presence on Los Negros, and we can grab the Momodi airfield, and obviously that's going to be a big game changer for your, for your advance across northern New Guinea. Um, now, he's just going from aerial recon photos. So Kruger, who is, as you know, MacArthur's ground commander at this point, commander of what's called the Sixth Army, sends in a brand new uh, group of uh, soldiers uh, called the Alamo Scouts, who have been trained for recon operations uh, on Japanese-controlled islands to figure out, you know, the level of, uh, of uh, defenses there. So the Alamo Scouts go in with, like, eyes on intel, and they're like, actually, there's a major Japanese presence there. So, you know, imagine you're MacArthur. You're having to sift through these sort of uh, divergent pieces of intel and decide what you're going to do, and he decides quite boldly uh, to send in a, like a battalion-sized force, it's about a thousand guys, um, to, to grab the Momodi airfield is February 29th, 1944, and uh, the Japanese had expected an invasion, but on this opposite coast, so they were sort of, uh, they were sort of surprised, and then they, they, they react to that, and it takes time, and the Americans reinforce the beachhead, so it's quite a ferocious battle that develops there ultimately, but the takeaway I want you to, to get is that he gets the airfield he needs, he neutralizes a lot of the, the uh, Japanese defenses there, and this accelerates his advance. So it makes possible the next piece of the puzzle in early 1944, which is an outflanking amphibious invasion at a place called Hollandia, sort of on the northwest coast of New Guinea. Um, and uh, he sends, there's two U.S. Army divisions that are going to go in here, 24th and the 41st Infantry Divisions, and you'll notice they're under the command of, of one of the other key uh, ground commanders, uh, Robert Eichelberger, who I mentioned a moment ago. So the invasion of Hollandia happens on April 22nd, 1944. 
and um, there's not that much Japanese opposition because you're landing in a rear area. How do they know it's a Japanese rear area? So this is an interesting story too, um, because the, the Allies know this because they have good intel on Japanese dispositions in order of battle along the New Guinea coast, and they know this because they're reading the, uh, the, the codes of the Imperial Japanese Army that have been captured in a, a stunning mishap by the Japanese armed forces. Um, by the end of 1943, they were retreating across the North New Guinea coast, and um, uh, you know, and of course, they were having to leave stuff behind. And they were starving, they were diseased, they were not in good shape. It's a terrible wilderness to fight in, and um, you know, they're having to abandon things. It was wet, it was moist, it was moldy, and so it was hard to burn a lot of things that you're leaving behind. So a Japanese, I think, signals officer. Um, you know, it's like, okay, well, I don't know what to do with this code book, can't take it with us, we've, we've got to get, you know, get rid of stuff, let's put it at the bottom of the steamer trunk and sink it into a swamp, the Allies will never find it. And of course, you know what happens next. The Allies find it, <laughs> the Australians in particular find it, they figure out this could be important, they use uh, early microwave technology to kind of bake and dry out the pages and they start to figure out something of the code. So, so what that means is you know where they are and where they're not on the coast, and so that in tandem with um, uh, Kenny launching the, these really devastating air raids against the, the Japanese airfields around Hollandia allows you to completely outflank them and to some extent compromise the, the Japanese position on New Guinea. So there's not that much fighting, but still it's a tough environment in which to operate as a whole. And as we mentioned, the, the, uh, the Japanese are going to react to what the Allies have done. So, um, there's Kruger again. Let's get a sense of who this guy is. Um, so he's 63 years old in, uh, in 1944. He's a year younger than MacArthur. He commanded the Admiralty's operations, and as I mentioned, he's the commander of the 6th Army. He's the rarest of rare birds in the United States Army in World War II. He's a foreign-born general. Only one other general was foreign-born, that's Ben Lear. Um, he was born in Canada. I don't know if that really counts, but... Um, <laughs> Maybe. Um, Kruger was born in Germany as uh, a son of a German officer. And uh, Kruger's father died. He was an only child, so he and his mother um, emigrated to the United States when Kruger was an adolescent. Um, it's really quite interesting to me personally because Kruger emigrated to, uh, to St. Louis because he had an uncle there. I'm from St. Louis and, uh, and I live there now. He had an uncle there who, uh, who owned a, uh, a brewery and there were a lot of German-American owned breweries in St. Louis in the late 19th century. So that's why they gravitated there. So think of that. You know, you have to learn an entirely new culture, uh, a new language. You have to, to try and fit in and grow up in this new circumstance. Um, you know, not, couldn't have been easy. Um, he is an incredible autodidact. He will ultimately speak English with hardly an accent at all. Obviously, he speaks German, he speaks French, he speaks Spanish. Um, and when the, the Spanish-American War breaks out, Kruger decides that he wants to join the Army and serve in the war. So he joined as a private, 17 years old, um, and is such an excellent soldier that he, he moves up the NCO ranks and then eventually earns a field commission. He's commissioned in the Philippines. Um, you know, and so, you know, he's had this sort of career in which eventually he's going to become a general not only with no West Point pedigree, no college degree, no high school diploma. I dare say that will never happen again. And yet really, <laughs> he's ahead of a lot of his colleagues in terms of his uh, military intellectualism. He writes these scholarly articles uh, for journals in, in the 1920s. Um, you know, he's a very dedicated soldier. He, uh, he is married by then. He's, he's a, has a very warm relationship with his wife, Grace. He has three kids. He's an outstanding father. He's a very devoted soldier. And the interesting thing about Kruger, and the reason I've chosen this, uh, this particular image, he has a real affinity for the average soldier. Why? Because he was one of them. You know? And so Kruger, when he came to your unit, if you were like a company commander, a battalion commander, or something like that, it was a little uncomfortable because he's constantly making sure your soldiers have dry socks or they're eating well or all that kind of stuff. And man, if they weren't, you were going to hear about it. Um, and he, so he had this rapport with enlisted soldiers, and yet, with his colleagues, here's the downside of Kruger, he's just impossible at times. He's brusque, he's insensitive, he says he's rude, he says the wrong thing, he doesn't get how he's offending you. Uh, and in terms of his operational outlook, he has a tendency to caution somewhat, but he's also very bright uh, and, and really quite courageous. But uh, so this is, this is what he liked to say, um, great quote, Weapons are no good unless there are guts at both ends of the bayonet. You know, that's uh, very much Kruger, you know. <laughs> uh, 
A close friend once said of him, he clung to what he thought was right with a bulldog's grip. And that is, that is, that is again, that is so Walter Kruger. Um, so here's the other key commander under MacArthur, whom I've already mentioned, but you see him in their middle. Uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger, who's 57 at that point. Who are these guys? This is Clovis Byers, who is his uh, uh, chief of staff, and they are so close. He's like his brother. Uh, this is one of the most successful uh, chief of staff commander relationships in the history of the United States Army. Uh, you know, Eichelberger is, is very close with his staff, and uh, this is Bob Bowen, his operations officer, who will eventually become a general himself and command the 187th uh, reg uh, Airborne Regimental Combat Team, as they called it, a mouthful, in, uh, in Korea. So, yeah, you see him here, and um, uh, he is going to eventually command the 8th Army, which will be a peer army with the 6th Army in, uh, in theater. So his background couldn't be more different than, uh, than Kruger's. Um, he's born uh, to a, uh, a really well-off family in, uh, in Ohio. He's the youngest of five children. Um, Eichelberger's father was a very successful lawyer, a, a, a Union Civil War veteran, and a, like a gentleman farmer. And so Eichelberger is reared on these stories of the Civil War, hearing veterans talk about uh, their experiences. Um, so it's a comfortable background, but the downside is that Eichelberger's father uh, was trying to sort of prepare his kids for the real world kind of thing, and he set them upon each other in, in almost like a, like a reality show kind of thing in, in these competitions. And so he's the youngest. You know, it's hard for him to compete with his older brothers and, and whatnot. So he usually came out on the short end, and he wasn't taken very seriously. This creates a kind of a, a chip on his shoulder in him a, and, a, and a kind of burning desire to achieve. And, uh, and so Eichelberger would find this, this, this uh, route to achieve in the Army. He, he goes to Ohio State University for one year, then leaves and, and goes uh, to West Point. He's in the class of 1909. Uh, there's a very other, one of his other famous classmates is a guy named George Patton. Uh, and I, I would argue they're very similar in their sort of operational philosophy. They're very aggressive. Uh, they kept in touch during the war. They, they remain good friends. I found a lot of their letters. It's really quite fascinating. So, um, so Eichelberger, you know, when he gets out of West Point, um, he, he meets uh, his soulmate, just as Grace was Kruger's soulmate. Um, Eichelberger's was uh, his wife, Emma. Um, they had no kids. They had each other, and they had Bob's career. And uh, Emma was a, a constant sort of sounding board um, and, and, uh, and like a, a, you know, a, a sort of a peer just uh, working with him. And the, the other thing, too, they, he wrote to her constantly. So it's wonderful from an historian standpoint. He wrote to her like two, three times a day, even in combat. So, you know, he's kind of a mini historian there, but it also showed this powerful bond that he, that he had with, uh, with Emma, you know. So um, when World War I breaks out, Eichelberger doesn't go to, to the Western Front. He goes to Siberia. Um, the, the Western allies in Japan had sent troops into Siberia to destroy the Bolshevik regime, and this was called the Polar Bear Expedition. So Eichelberger saw combat there. He was an intel officer there. He got the Distinguished Service Cross. Um, and the other interesting thing, too, he worked alongside the Japanese and studied them. So like Kruger, he would file that word away and use it later in his career. Eichelberger knew MacArthur because he'd worked for him when he was chief of staff. Uh, Eichelberger was garrulous, he was warm, he was witty and charming and friendly, and he had hardly an enemy in the world. He was just fun to be around. He had tons of friends throughout the army. Okay, so what's the problem? That sensitivity, that vaingloriousness, that chip on the shoulder at times. And so you can imagine him dealing with someone like Kruger who's brusque, who's rude, and all that. And so he just, by 1944, he's just had it with Kruger because he thinks he's just such a jerk to deal with. Um, Eichelberger can't fathom being rude to people um, on that level. And he also thinks Kruger's way too cautious. He'll eventually call him old molasses in January, you know, in letters to Emma and all this. So Kruger, for his turn, thinks that uh, Eichelberger is too aggressive and that he's too indulgent with his staff. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, that's the, the sort of difference in these two guys who really have a lot more in common than, than otherwise, but that's how they see it, okay? So MacArthur will figure this out and learn to play one off against the other, and you're already seeing this by 1944. So after the successful invasion of Hollandia, um, you know, this is sort of what Eichelberger is dealing with, developing a base. So he, this is a wilderness, <laughs> and you now have to turn it into a major American city. My job is to direct traffic and road construction, Eichelberger later wrote. And he was a beautiful writer, by the way. I highly recommend his uh, memoir to you, Our Jungle Road to Tokyo. Um, he had a ghostwriter on that. I really don't know why, because uh, he was a fine writer. 
Um, Kruger also wrote a, uh, a memoir uh, called From Down Under to Nippon. I'm sorry, it's an incredible dud. Uh, it's basically just the Sixth Army operational reports regurgitated into this book form, um, and it, it really doesn't show you the, the true humanity of, of this man. It's really a, a missed opportunity in that regard. But, but Eichelberger wrote about this job he's got, and he said, and, and I had to demand speed, speed, speed. Road construction was a gigantic task. Sides of mountains were carved away. Bridges and culverts were thrown across rivers. Gravel and stone was poured into sago swamps to make highways as tall as Mississippi levees. So under his supervision for that next few months in 1944, uh, they built 72 miles of two and four lane roads out of nothing, 135 miles of fuel pipeline to pump the aviation gas, three million feet of warehouse and building space Army engineers build, a harbor, a floating dock, jetties, cranes, tugboats, motorboats, steel barges, petroleum storage facilities, all this kind of stuff all of a sudden in this place called Hollandia. It could accommodate 140,000 troops, the port handled more supply tonnage than any other port in New Guinea, and it represented this unglamorous reality of life and uh, of operating in New Guinea and moving on to the Philippines. There were 800,000 tons of material arriving on New Guinea each month by the end of 1944. So the incredible productivity came at the price of overwork, exhaustion, low morale, and a constant battle with the elements in a lousy place in which to operate. Uh, the strain on the overstretched port companies, poor schlubs like this, unloading the ships all round the clock was just unimaginable. The, the, the strain on the engineer units, keeping the roads operating, keeping uh, you know, the airfields in operation, the, the petroleum, the warehouse, all this stuff is just immense. And many of the soldiers who are operating in the port companies were African American soldiers serving in segregated units uh, and being worked often even harder than the, than the white troops and certainly not treated as equals. And this was also emblematic into the reality of the U.S. war effort in World War II, uh, segregation and inequality and sometimes racial repression too that was going on. So if you're one of the, the soldiers in one of these port companies, it is not a, a, a nice environment in which to operate. It's tough enough to deal with New Guinea, much less with Jim Crow segregation. But regardless of the, the, the sort of uh, racial repression of the time, Everyone was in the same boat when it came to dealing with misery of life on New Guinea. The place seemed specially designed by Mother Nature to confound and harass humanity. You practically look at it and you've got malaria, you know? I mean, it's just a horrible place. No indigenous waste facilities. Soldiers had to burn or bury tons of noxious garbage, or a lot of times they loaded aboard barges and just sent it out to sea. How did they, uh, they deal with, um, say, uh, bodily uh, functions? Here's how, and this is not pleasant. Trenches or 55 gallon drums served as toilets. That was it. Luckless privates drew the terrible job of spraying fuel on the offal and burning it, and you can imagine that, in a tropical environment. It was a preview of what a later generation will experience in Vietnam. Ask any Vietnam about, you know, offal burning detail is the polite way I can put it, and they will never forget that and that smell. Uh, temperatures are usually in the 80s or the 90s, uh, high humidity. It's so hot outside, sweat comes out like water out of a squeegee sponge, one officer wrote his wife. Mold inundated everything. Equipment moldered and rusted quickly. Ammo was degraded and ruined in that kind of environment. Millions of dollars worth of supplies went to waste. Just one example for you. A representative food shipment at a, at a place called Finsaven. 25% of the corned beef, 37% of tomato and fruit juice was found unfit for consumption. Very, very typical. Wastage, just appalling. Engineers had to purify millions of gallons of, uh, of stream and river water uh, to provide your drinking water and your washing water. And of course, for medics, you need a lot of that water. Uh, what were you eating? Can rations, tin fruits, um, tin vegetables, greasy spam, much of it coming from here, of course, from the, the, the minute. So that, that's a great point of pride that uh, you would have fed spam to the soldiers, right? Uh, Vienna sausages would have been one thing you would have eaten. Uh, and stomach-churning, dehydrated potatoes, eggs, and milk. Yuck. Uh, there was a brand of GI butter, uh, specially designed for the tropics. And the good news was that it didn't melt. The bad news was it was like gelatinous grease that would just sort of stay on the bread and not spread out. So you just eat this little goop with your bread. <laughs> Disgusting. I think anyone on New Guinea would have given his right arm for a glass of cold, fresh milk. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Milton Cloud, a physician, um, said, and I, I think that, that's so true. Uh, rats and insects plagued the troops. Uh, I, again, I would argue 
Pacific theater is an interspecies war to a great extent. Just to operate in this environment, you are dealing with terrible uh, insects and animal problems. So uh, the ants are simply exasperating. Sergeant Paul Kinder wrote in a letter to friends, you cannot put anything down but that they find it. Anything that one doesn't seal airtight. Where you think of them in the hundreds, I have them by the millions. And from tiny pesky quarter inch ones on up to an inch in length of all species and colors. He once made the mistake of leaving a candy bar unattended for about an hour. He came back and it was literally gone. <laughs> the ants had devoured the candy bar into nothingness. The swamps and jungles teemed with disease-bearing insects. A new strain of scrub typhus was discovered uh, in, in the hard way, borne by tiny mites that clung to grass blades and led to an outbreak with a 4% fatality rate. Uh, and the medics then had to deal with that, as you can imagine. Mosquitoes spread malaria, of course, in massive ways. That was, the most, that was the most common disease. And it absorbed enormous effort and resource in SWAPA just to prevent the total debilitation of MacArthur's army. So, you know, we sit here looking at the sweeping of the maps and the units and all that, but the reality was disease was threatening to basically bring your army to a standstill at various times in the, in the war in the South Pacific. Uh, so at one point in, in uh, the latter part of 1943, malaria alone was claiming nearly five soldiers uh, for every one you were losing in combat to the Japanese. So imagine that. That's almost Civil War-ish, you know. Uh, but fortunately, malaria was usually not fatal, but the average case was usually in the hospital for about a month, and obviously then there were recurrences too, or relapses. So uh, obviously you've got a lot of people down with malaria at any given time. By the middle of 1944, there were 47 specially formed anti-malaria units operating on New Guinea. It had doubled by later in the year. So um, they're trying to enforce anti-malaria measures that are not terribly popular among soldiers. Make sure to have your, your, um, you know, your tunic on, uh, no shirtless, uh, may roll down your sleeves. Oh, that's going to be very popular when it's 98 degrees with 90-something percent humidity. Soldiers are going to love that, especially artillerymen. You know, I mean, you could just imagine the resistance to this, sleeping under a mosquito net. Um, you know, wear your leggings. I mean, who wanted to wear leggings anyway, but especially in this kind of environment. So these were unpopular things. It was tough to enforce that. They try to uh, flame out the, uh, the malaria breeding areas and swamps, drain the swamps, flame them out, and uh, uh, they have bug bombs. You can imagine how toxic this must have been, the insecticide with these bug bombs that you would put in camps and they're just floating all over the area and it's, it's noxious. But really, the number one way to deal with malaria was pharmaceutical. Uh, at the taking of adabrine, which didn't cure the disease but suppressed the symptoms. Uh, so when, when MacArthur's armies get adabrine, uh, from him on down, there becomes a kind of a culture of, of enforcing the taking of adabrine, whether soldiers liked it or not, and they didn't. Um, so you can imagine yourself as a sergeant or as a lieutenant uh, or as a captain, for that matter, whatever, forcing your guys to take uh, adabrine and dealing with rumors of, uh, of what adabrine could do one of which was adabrine psychosis, uh, which was true in about one out of every thousand cases, but who wanted to be that one, right? Um, the other rumor, which was much more influential, but absolutely total balderdash, was that adabrine would make you sterile. Okay, so you can imagine when that rumor gets started, how you're going to have to deal with that as a position of authority, and then the whole dynamic here of, well, you know, the, the lieutenant says it's fine, the captain says, yeah, you think they're going to tell you that, you know, and so, you know, I'm going to sneak my adabrine to the side and not take it because I don't want to be sterile and all this kind of stuff. It's an enormous problem. I'll give you an example here. Um, one unit alone before the taking of adabrine had 3,300 cases of malaria uh, per 1,000 soldiers. So think about that a second. 3,300 cases per 1,000 soldiers after the taking of Adabrine, down to 31 per 1,000. Uh, so Adabrine literally allows MacArthur's uh, armies to continue their advance. The good news, the Japanese were in worse shape. Outflanked at Hollandia, uh, debilitated by disease. Um, they don't have enough food. They don't have enough medicine. They're starving, they've got malaria, they've got the other tropical diseases, they're really running out of steam. So many began to refer to, to New Guinea as a green desert. And an eerie phrase circulated among them, from New Guinea, no one comes back alive. One shuddered to his diary, the fearfulness of living in the jungle cannot be expressed in words. My friends are dead, I'm steadily growing lonely, the end of my life at 25 is regrettable, but this is my fate, I cannot help it. And then the last entry was just, oh God. You know, uh, thousands of these guys just died of disease out there in the wilderness of malaria. One rare survivor 
uh, recalled after the war about his perilous trek. He wrote, lack of protein fostered a kind of madness in us. We ate anything, flying insects, worms, and rotten palm trees. We fought over the distribution of those worms. If you managed to knock down a lizard with a stick, you'd pop it in your mouth with its tail wriggling. Of the seven, I know it's sick, isn't it? <laughs> of 7,000 men in his unit, only 67 survived. Yeah. So the Japanese were getting it much worse. Uh, so they're desperate, and their response to the success of the Landy operation is, okay, well, let's hit them on either side. So any successful flanking movement often will have a reaction, and you have to defend that. Okay, so um, here you've gone past them along the coast. You can see Hollandia, but there are stranded Japanese garrisons here and over here. So a lot of that middle part of 1944, I won't call it the summer because it's the southern hemisphere, it's actually the winter. Uh, so I'm talking like from, from June to about September 1944 is absorbed in trying to secure both of those flanks. So Kruger's 6th Army is, is quite bogged down fighting in the west at Lone Tree Hill, the 6th Infantry Division, and, uh, and, a, and a, another regimental combat team. And in the east, the Drinamore River Campaign, which isn't all that well known, but it was quite a... Uh, quite a crisis to, to deal with those ferocious Japanese attacks because they have nothing more to lose. Now the Japanese fail, but it costs you time, it costs you casualties, it costs you resources, it costs you, um, you know, headspace. And uh, at the same time, MacArthur has launched a new invasion of a place called Biak. This is in late May 1944, um, like the northwest part of New Guinea as a last sort of capstone step to eventually moving on to the Philippines, which as you know, is his great um, intention. Well, once again, I talked about intel earlier. They think that there's just a nothing left over Japanese garrison there. It's not. It's, it's a potent garrison. Uh, it can defend the airfield. And the biggest thing about Biak is the caves. Look at these caves. These are men down here. It gives you a sense of the size of some of these caves. Um, so this is a, a, a sort of major moment in the Pacific War in that for the first time, sort of, you see the Japanese start to, to stop defending at the waterline and defend inland and so using good defensible terrain to just kind of bleed the Americans. Now, the Japanese aren't doing this deliberately initially at Biak. They just do it over time. And they bog down the 41st Infantry Division for days and eventually weeks in June 1944, again, robbing the momentum of the advance. MacArthur is itching to get to the Philippines. Kruger is dealing with all this mess in New Guinea. And then the Biak thing. And uh, so he puts enormous pressure on, uh, on this guy, the 41st Division commander, Major General Horace Fuller, uh, another classmate of Eichelberger's. And uh, so does Kruger put pressure on him in person? No, he never visits. And this is not necessarily to his credit. But remember, he's got to deal with all this other stuff in New Guinea, so he can't be everywhere at once. So there's a weird dynamic that he sends two staff officers there to kind of examine Fuller, their superior after all, and report back to him. And uh, they tell him, well, no, I mean, Fuller's not doing well, but keep him in place, but uh, he's going to need some help. So Eichelberger is sent in there as a sort of a fireman uh, to kind of help police up the battlefield and gain some momentum with this. When that happens, though Fuller and Eichelberger are very good friends, Fuller takes deep offense, and he's so angry and so, uh, so hates Kruger so much that he just decides, I'm going to resign. The hell with them kind of thing. <laughs> um, so he's thinking about himself in a way more than his people, though his people revered him, and he was, by all accounts, a very good division commander, but he's just fed up with Kruger and his brusqueness. Um, so it's an interesting sort of p personal dynamic. Eichelberger tried to dissuade him from this. He would not be dissuaded. Uh, Eichelberger is able to, to, to gain some reinforcements that, that Kruger has sent him and conceive of, of new attacks. And uh, being Eichelberger, he's always a lead from the front kind of guy. You see him here with his Tommy gun and all that. So it helps turn the situation around at Biak. But I'll tell you, you know, you're now to the end of June 1944. Um, and this has cost you a lot of time and resources. So. It does, though, make possible this, this uh, sort of capstone operation in 1944, the invasion of Leyte, the great return to the Philippines. And uh, it's, of course, an enormous battle that I, that I won't delve into in, in you know, crucial, in sort of tortuous detail. But I just want to get, give you a sense of the scale of it. 738 ships in the invasion fleet under Vice Admiral Tommy Kincaid's Seventh Fleet. Halsey's Third Fleet adds another 105 warships, and that's, that's, you know, sort of the operational cream of the Navy among the surface vessels and aviation side, a lot of the fleet carriers and whatnot. Um, and, of course, what's necessary to carry four U.S. Army divisions. Look at that right here. It's a four-division invasion. So, technically speaking, in terms of amphibious troops and the naval component, 
This is a bigger American contribution to an invasion than Normandy. And yet Operation King II, as it's known, isn't particularly well remembered, uh, although in the Philippines it is, but maybe not necessarily here as much as it could be. So four divisions are going in along Leyte's east coast, and you can see what's necessary to carry them. 235,000 tons of combat vehicles, 200,000 tons of medical supplies, 200,000 tons of ammo, more than a ton for every man who's going to storm ashore on the beaches. It's staggering. 151 LSTs, 420 troop-carrying ships. These are floating American cities. And in addition, you have Rear Admiral Robert Glover's service force, a fleet of oilers, water tankers, salvage ships, and ammo ships, in order to sustain and supply it. The Navy had become very good at forward supply while operations are ongoing uh, by this point in the war. So you're talking about the unglamorous side of the Navy there, too. The oilers, the tankers, you know, the, all of this kind of stuff, it's necessary in order to keep the fleet going. Um, one example alone, one water tanker dispensed 43,000 plus barrels of water to 125 vessels. You've got to have fresh water. They don't all have desalination plants, you know, and the soldiers need water too. So there's 150,000 soldiers under Kruger's 6th Army that you're carrying and another 50,000 sailors. The invasion unfolds, unfolds on uh, October 20th. Uh, MacArthur called it A-Day. He didn't want to call it D-Day. He resented Eisenhower deeply. He had been his former aide, and he wanted to eclipse him at this point. No, we'll call it A-Day. Uh, so October 20th is A-Day. He writes to uh, his soulmate, Jean, uh, his wife, tomorrow we land. I am in good fettle and hope to do my part tomorrow in the days that follow. And he certainly did. Um, they catch the Japanese by surprise somewhat. You know, uh, the Japanese have about one division on Leyte, uh, but the, the key to the Leyte battle is that they're going to be able to reinforce and they're going to decide to fight a showdown battle there on air, land, and sea. So at Leyte, at Leyte you know, MacArthur's headquarters is going to be under air raids a lot. Um, the, the actual headquarters where, his, where he is located. Uh, the Walter Scott Price House, who he had been a, uh, an American veteran of the Philippine-American War, who makes a home there, makes a life there. He'd been incarcerated by the Japanese. Unfortunately, he will not survive. Um, he'll be liberated in 1945, but he will, he will, he will die after that. Um, so, you know, MacArthur's getting bombed because um, he doesn't completely control the air. Of course, the Battle of Leyte Gulf eventuates from, from the Japanese counteroffensive on October 24th and 25th, which is, you know, an enormous naval battle of great importance. And then the land battle, which means both sides are reinforcing, and it becomes this sort of battle of attrition, mainly fought in the, for the central spine, the high ground in the middle of Leyte, which is a nightmare. Um, just operating on Leyte, you can see just unloading, look at the mud, look at the swamps. And by the way, there's three typhoons that come in in about a 10-day period in the wake of your invasion, dumping 32 inches of water, um, a lot of it there that you're looking at. So imagine unloading ships, moving the supplies inland as you advance, um, and, you know, and then you're fighting Japanese reinforcements. Um, the Major General John Hodge, the 24th Corps commander, later said of his men, we were never dry from the time they got ashore until the battle was over. Lieutenant Gage Rodman of the 7th Division wrote to his family, the mud was knee deep and shiny. Every slow spot was a thin soup of dirt and water. Digging a foxhole amounted to digging a bathtub. Vehicles got stuck in the mud. Moving supplies was a total nightmare. Engineers couldn't build stable roads and airfields. Uh, Leyte's infrastructure just wasn't good. And of course, Leyte too is one of the biggest battles of World War II. It rages. Uh, MacArthur says for weeks, it's actually for months. He has that propensity of, okay, well, I know I'm just declaring the battle is over and I'm moving on to something else, but the Japanese sort of have other ideas, you know? So, um, Leyte, yeah, the worst of it rages from October 20th to maybe Christmas time, but the fighting still lingers on there for months. It's not over till May 1945. Eichelberger's 8th Army is going to take over by the end of the year, and these are the people he loses in so-called mopping up operations, that hateful phrase that is really very offensive to any combat soldier who happens to be the mop, right? 432 killed and over 1,800 wounded for 8th Army. Filipino guerrillas played a key intel and support role for the whole campaign here and, of course, other islands. Um, so you have that. The Americans, as I mentioned, never really controlled the air. Logistics were a nightmare. Every division needed at least 300 tons a day just to subsist, much less attack. So imagine trying to move all that stuff to the front. Uh, commanders used any vehicle they could, including even animals, uh, carabaos, draft animals uh, prevalent in the Philippines. 
Um, and they tried to hire Filipinos, many of whom had no interest in being part of a carrying party to the front lines for after all, you know. So there's always a problem. They use airdrops. Um, the 11th Air Cargo Resupply Squadron parachuted 1.1 million tons of supplies in the course of the campaign. So if you're a combat soldier on Leyte, you're one of these guys, quite often you're, you're getting that forward supply where you're beyond your, your land supply route and air, uh, aircraft, C-47s and perhaps other smaller aircraft are coming in and dropping supplies to you way out where you're operating in the wilderness. And, and that's how you fight. Um, Leyte is a humanitarian operation too because uh, just to, to, you know, you're there to liberate the archipelago uh, and create a post-Japanese -ind post independence and future, and you are trying to help the locals subsist and survive, so you're having to feed them. That only adds to your logistical issues. So um, disease is rife, not just malaria, which comes back with a vengeance now, but schistosomiasis, because you're operating in swamps quite often. That's a nightmare to deal with, so the medical evacuation situation was bad. Um, and very challenging, and this is the first time you see uh, small helicopters used to evacuate uh, wounded soldiers. Uh, so neither side ultimately gets what it wants out of Leyte. The Japanese had hoped to win showdown battles, air, land, and sea. They lost all of them, but obviously it was quite costly for the Americans too. Um, at a minimum, the Japanese lose probably something in order about 50,000 killed in ground operations on Leyte. The Americans, 3,504, 12,000 wounded, and 89 missing. Um, another 2,500 sailors and aviators were killed or wounded, of course, many of them in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. So it proves almost useless as a base, and due to its climate, its poor soil, and its lousy infrastructure, um, you're not going to get much out of it. Uh, Luzon is going to be a much bigger operation that follows in, in January 1945. So uh, by the end of the uh, 44, the army in the Pacific Theater has uh, liberated, you know, much of our map here and moved on to the Philippines. Um, it's an enormously sophisticated so, uh, force, and it's penetrated Japan's inner defenses, inflicting irreplaceable losses on the Japanese, and it now stood on the cusp of administering really knockout blows the next year in 1945. Uh, so the Army is going to serve as a very powerful fist for those blows. Thank you. Okay, I want you all to be respectful of our veteran tonight. He's just a kid, he's inexperienced, he's not gonna be 100 till next year. Youngster. I, uh, I had really hoped to have some Army veterans here for the program. We're stuck with a sailor. <laughs> next best thing, okay. next best thing. <laughs> Well, we'll make the best of it. What's that? And I'm going to get to that. Okay. Okay. Jim McDougall, he was a PBY crewman. I'm going to go through a lot of this stuff fairly quickly to save some time here. Um, he, entered, he entered the Navy in October 1942. He flew with uh, VPB-52, the Black Cats. It's a PBY unit. Planes were painted black because they usually flew at night. Um, Jim was an armor, arm, aviation ordnance man. And uh, Jim, you participated in a couple of interesting operations. I've got to keep the mic here with me. I'll do this. If, uh, if, if we have issues with the mic, uh, let us know if you can't hear up in the back how we're, how we're doing. I have no concept of how the mic is projecting, so. Um, you flew several types of missions, reconnaissance, air-sea rescue, courier missions, and attack missions, right. right? Right. If you were flying a recon mission and you found something noteworthy, you had certain ordnance that you could use to uh, attack. Right. And you attacked a couple of Japanese ships. Right. Do you want to talk about that? Well, um, our... our uh job at that particular time was to uh, cut the, Japan, uh, the Japanese supply line from uh, uh, Japan to a ball. And uh, then from a ball, the uh, uh, smaller boats would take out to the uh, islands that the Japanese had captured 
to resupply them. Uh, our our uh, mission was to uh, cut that supply line before it got to a ball. And uh, 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 what we would do is uh, take take off about uh, uh, six o'clock in the evening, and uh, we would fly up to our uh, area of the, where we were to patrol. And we would patrol at, at night. Uh, and we uh, had a radar, uh, which the, Jap which the, uh, the, the British had developed, airborne radar. And uh, we would put our radar on search and just uh, fly back and forth until we uh, located a ship. We then turned our plane toward the uh, toward that ship and home in on it. Uh, as soon as we could see the wake, we would drop down and preferably come from the rear and drop uh, four bombs uh, in train. Uh, a 500 pound bomb, a thousand, a thousand, and a 500 pound bomb, in, in hopes that uh, one of those uh, four uh, bombs would uh, hit the ship. Uh, because these uh, bombs had four second delayed action fuses, when they did hit the ship, they'd get down through the decks to the bottom of the ship and blow the bottom out of the ship. Um, it was uh, uh, the, f the, f the first time that uh, I was uh, involved in an in a operation like that. It, was, it seemed so simple. Uh, what happened was we just hit the ship and, and I seen the ship go down. And uh, the crew, this is, this this is really a simple operation, you know. This is a transport ship, right? This it was a, a transport ship. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Not a lot of combat power. Oh, right. Okay. So you thought you were going to do it again, right? Yeah. And the next time, okay. the next time, uh, we were anxious to uh, find another ship, and so about a week and a half later. Uh, we were on patrol, and we had got this blip. We turned and uh, to, to toward it, and we got a, within uh, about two miles of it. The thing opened up, and what what had happened was we had uh, attacked a Japanese cruiser. And they had guns that you couldn't believe. And uh, they, uh, the, the shells were whistling by on all sides of the aircraft. And how it ever, we ever got through it, I don't know. But it sure uh, made us uh, realize that they weren't all, you know, as easy as the first one was. Okay, but, you, had, you had an important courier mission with 17 bags, air uh, mail right, bags. Right, right. And uh, do you want to just briefly talk about that? Because this is his big connection to the Army. So, you know, this is. Uh, well, uh, the uh, plans were put together for uh, the invasion, uh, for, the <clears throat> for the invasion of uh, uh, the Philippines. And uh, they were distributed, and then the uh, uh, army um, uh, de uh, decided that, uh, that that those plans were not what they were supposed to be. In other words, if they would follow through with those plans, they would 
probably uh, not met with much success. There was a, there was a disagreement between the army and MacArthur, or the navy and MacArthur. Correct. So MacArthur modified the plans. That's correct. Uh, um, um, the uh, navy told MacArthur that he should change them. So he wasn't convinced until the Navy surrounded the, the uh, Leyte section of the Philippine Islands and found that, that where he wanted to uh, invade the uh, um, uh, island was the strongest, uh, 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 stronger than any of the other places. And they pointed out that he should be attacking at Leyte and not where he was at, uh, going to do, uh, go in at, the, at first. So this meant, um, and finally they convinced him that that was uh, to be. So they uh, changed the, uh, they changed the plans uh, at the uh, uh, Lake Centennial, where uh, the head headquarters was. They changed the plans, and uh, so the new plans had to be taken out to the, to the fleet. So uh, because of this freshwater lake where uh, the headquarters was, they had us come in pick up the uh, <clears throat> 17 bags of, of uh, plans and uh, take them out to the fleet. Okay. Jim, I'm really glad you had an opportunity to help the Army. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. And I want to get back to the Army. I'm an Army guy. I can't help it. I got my, got my prejudice. Um, we have a problem. Uh, guys like Jim are getting harder and harder to find. One of the big strengths of the Roundtable for 36 years has been giving, uh, giving veterans the opportunity to talk, to present their stories. So how are we going to do that in the future? So tonight, I want to try something. I've spent a lot of years interviewing veterans. We have oral histories. I have a number of them here that were done for the Minnesota Historical Society Greatest Generation Project. I did a lot of them when I was the curator of the Military Museum at Camp Ripley. Through these oral histories, veterans can still talk. And we can present those stories. We can present the first person accounts. They can't be here to do it, but the words survive and we can still present that. So I'm going to try that tonight, see how it works. I've, uh, we're running out of time. Um, I've got about, I found it really hard to edit these things down. And I've got uh, about 20 minutes worth of stories, and that's going to put us way over. So I'm, I'm going to read two of them. And uh, then I, uh, I think you're all going to go outside and, and buy John's book and have him sign I'm all it. for that. Yeah. I authorize yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> okay. These are Minnesotans. Uh, uh, they served in the Pacific in the Army. Oh, first, I forgot to put your picture up. There's Jim. That's before he got handsome. Okay. This is a picture that was in Yank Magazine, the Australian version, and uh, he's up in his PBY there. Okay? So. Okay. Uh, this is Carl Plato with his brother who served on a minesweeper. Carl grew up outside Philadelphia. His family lost everything in the Depression, but he had an uncle in Minnesota who was a doctor, and he got Carl into the U of M pre-med. It was 1942, and Carl's heart wasn't in it. He tried to enlist in the Navy and the Air Force, but they wouldn't take him because he was slightly colorblind. The paratroopers were glad to have him, and he was assigned to the 11th Airborne Division. The 11th arrived in New Guinea in May and June of 1944. They arrived in Leyte in the Philippines on the 18th of November. These are some of Carl's comments. If you didn't have total confidence, you couldn't endure in the jungles. You'd crack up. Um, you'd have stood up and run out of the foxhole. 
you'd have done crazy things, or you would have quit. But I never saw any of that because the guys were so well prepared. And in front of your buddies, you would never give in. The other thing about it was that you didn't think, you just reacted. You didn't wonder, what am I going to do now? No. You were so disciplined, you just performed. The greatest characteristic for our success was the training of the paratroopers, the discipline, your confidence, your ability to act. It just made it possible for you to live. There's a camaraderie amongst all of us that was just, it was simply beautiful. We were totally interdependent on one another. I saw one guy after a lady who didn't want to go any further, take his rifle and stick it between his toes and blow his toes off so he could go back to the States. He got court-martialed, got a dishonorable discharge, and the guys would have killed him just because he betrayed them. At night, you'd be two hours on and two hours off. At night, when it started getting dark, like fireflies, you'd see on the base of the trees, little fluorescence in the foliage, and you'd memorize that because if anything ever blocked those little lights, you knew there was something crawling up. The worst part was, it started getting dark at night, and you'd hear this, hoy, 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 and you'd wonder, my God, here we are now. Are we going to make it tonight, or are we all going to be killed? You had a number of hand grenades. You didn't want to shoot your rifle, because then, you'd know, then they'd know where you were from the flash of your rifle, so you'd throw hand grenades at them. And I also think that some of, the, some of the Japanese were drunk with sake before they'd make a charge. Clearing caves. The Japanese were into caves. That's where the demolition came in. Carl was a demolition man. The flamethrower was the only way you could burn them out. You could throw a satchel charge in there, or you could throw hand grenades. But the best way was to burn them out, because you could go up to about 150 feet with that fireball. And you'd hear them scream, and they'd come running out, and the guys would shoot them, pick them off one by one. They were fierce. They'd never give up. So this was the last day. I sat down against a palm tree, and Denipol sat next to me. He says, Jesus, we made it. And he tips his helmet back, and all of a sudden, a single shot ran out. And I looked over, and there was a hole just above his nose. He was gone. We left him sitting there. We were all so exhausted. Here I was, 126 pounds in this mud and filth and dirt. We hadn't shaved, limping. At an aid station, they cut off my boots, and my legs began to swell up from the knees down. They called it jungle rot. So about 5 o'clock, this doctor came by and put a piece of cardboard with a big E on it around my neck, evacuation. You'll be evacuated tomorrow. This was Christmas Eve day. Carl missed the parachute jump on Tegate Ridge, but eventually rejoined his unit and made the jump at Apari, and later served in the occupation of Japan. Returning to the U.S., he and four or five of his friends went to a famous hotel in, in San Francisco. The maitre d' said, did you just arrive? And where are you from? We're in the paratroopers, he said. The maitre d' said, the dinners are on us, steak and champagne. After the war, he returned to the U of M and used his GI Bill to study the new field of hospital administration. He went on to build the Fairview Hospital System in Minnesota. I asked him where he ranked his military experiences in his very successful life. Very, very high. About 20 years ago, I went through a terrible experience. I was president of Fairview. We had an episode in which I was attacked from some people behind the scenes, political, I was almost destroyed in the process. There was a critical dinner meeting held one night with the board of directors in which charges were leveled against me. I remember sitting there quietly thinking to myself, I've gone through much worse than this. And I actually felt, you guys don't know what you're up against. I've seen much worse. Low on time, you want me to read one more? Okay. Oh. This is Stuart Lindman. He grew up in South Minneapolis. Shortly after Pearl Harbor, 19-year-old Charles uh, Stuart Lindman found out he was colorblind when he tried to become an Air Force pilot. All that water with sharks made him want to stay out of the Navy. <laughs> but he thought, the Army can be very dirty, but if you get hit or injured, usually there are other men around to help you. Maybe the best deal is to go in the Army. 
Initially, he was sent to the ASTP program. In 1944, he was transferred to A Company, 321st Medical Battalion, 96th Infantry Division, as a stretcher bearer. We were privates. We were the lowest of the low, and our job was to pick up the wounded and get them to the battalion aid station. We'd learned in the Pacific that the Japanese had no interest, no respect for the Red Cross, so we had no Red Crosses on our helmets. We wore no armbands. The night before we were to strike Lady, we sat on board the USS Arthur Middleton. I remember so vividly, four of us on the litter squad, and we discussed our fathers in World War I, and we decided we weren't heroes. We don't want any medals. We'd do our duty as God gave us the strength to do, but we were not going to volunteer for anything because this is the way you got injured. This is the way you got killed, and we wanted no part of that. It was, of course, self-preservation. So we decided none of us were going to volunteer. We'd do what we were ordered to do. We were Army men. They decided we should be armed. So the night before we hit Leyte, they broke out 03, that's Springfield rifles. They were packed in Cosmolina. We spent the night before the invasion cleaning out those rifles, of which we had no knowledge and no training. We didn't know how to operate them, but we landed with those O3s. We got up early in the morning. We're going in. When you came up on deck, I'd never seen so many. I didn't realize the United States owned so many ships and the thunderous roar of the battleships pounding that island of Lady, you were convinced there'd be nothing left when you got there. We were so loaded with equipment we could barely run. Get rid of the gas masks. The second thing to go was the rifle. We picked up carbines. As you came in, you could see a soldier's body in the water. You know, the arms washing. Or you'd see a dead man on the beach in a very terrible position as he fell, and you realized, they're killing us. This is live ammunition. This had happened to me at any instant. I was the first to encounter a Japanese survivor. We were digging in. It was the first or second night, and the infantry had blown an ammo dump. And one of the men had been hurt and called, Medic! Medic! I remember Captain Sims saying in his loud voice, I won't order any man out of this area. Who wants to volunteer? I didn't miss a beat. I kept digging as fast as I could. All of a sudden, our squad leader says, we'll go. Just a couple of nights before, we'd agreed there'd be no volunteering. Here we were, the squad leader says, we'll go. So he picked up his carbine and jumped over the parapet and disappeared into the tall grass. The second and third man carried the litter, and I came out the rear with a carbine. I got on top of the parapet, and one of the men yelled, Jap! Here was a Japanese soldier at my feet, crouching in a hole. This was a technique of the Japanese. They'd let you pass and shoot you in the back. They'd pick off the fourth, man fir the fourth man first, third man second, second man third, and the first man last. Of course, I had him at a disadvantage. I was carrying my rifle at port arms, and I was standing right on top of him. That's something I have told very few people, and it bothered me for a long while because I kept thinking, some family in Japan is going to get the news that you didn't want your family to get. I remember praying about that. Uh, so often. After Lady, the 96th Division was sent to Okinawa. I remember as we approached, we listened to Tokyo Rose broadcasting to us. She told us what our division was, who our commanding officer was, and what the garrison was that was going to meet, that we were going to meet, and what they were going to do to us, and what our girlfriends were doing back home with the boy next door. We laughed and laughed, but in my heart, I thought they know a lot more about us than I, th than I thought they knew. <laughs> we were real close buddies. And boy, did we love those guys and did they love us. No matter what your background was, we had one man who was a tramp. That was how he was registered. He had no job. I remember we were asked to volunteer and this man stood up and he said, I'll go. I have no family. Nobody's going to miss me. I'll go. We had a boy from the Appalachians who couldn't read, couldn't write. He volunteered all the time. Everyone was writing letters to his girlfriend back home for him. We all became good friends, very close. When we sailed from San Francisco, we had about 200 men on our company. And it got to the point where there were just 12 of us originals who were not killed or wounded. Uh, this is, goes into next year. Forgive me, I, but OK. No problem. Uh, he's on Okinawa now. We were ordered to be taken back off the line. There were two squads, and we were going to get on this weapons carrier to be taken back to get some rest. As we boarded the truck, I said, 
I forgot my rifle. You're living with your rifle every day. How does a soldier forget his rifle? I went back and picked it up and came back to the truck, and the men were so weary and so tired, rather than sliding down the seats, they just sat there. I jumped in the truck and walked down the bed of the truck and sat behind the driver. Just as I sat down, there was a deafening roar. We realized we'd been hit. I went out the front of the truck, out the passenger side, and I ran across a ditch maybe 50 or 100 yards to an ambulance, and I crawled under it. There was silence. I realized it was all over. I started crawling out, and I realized that I'd been hit. I had absolutely no pain. When I tried to get out from under the truck, then I saw the blood all over. My right arm had been broken. My right hand had been shot. My left hand had been shot. The biggest wound was my left leg, and I couldn't walk. How I ran, I don't know. Adrenaline. You do strange things. The men who were replacing us were right there, so I was put in a makeshift ambulance. There were about 10 or 12 of us on that truck. The driver just took off. Nobody know what knew, knew what happened to him. The man who was sitting at the end of the truck, where I would have sat had everyone slid down, my buddy told me, was so badly mangled, there was hardly anything to pick up. There were four of us who were not killed. Two subsequently died. Lindman was medically evacuated. After a home leave, he continued his recovery at Fort Lawton, north of, north of Seattle. We didn't know anything about an atomic bomb, what it would do. No one prayed harder for a second bomb. Oh, drop several of them, get this war over. Stop it, stop it. The war did end. I was discharged from Fort McCoy. I got on a bus and was transported back to Minneapolis jumped on a streetcar and came home and rang the doorbell. My mother said, are you home for good? That was the end of it. That was the end of my war experience. Back in Minneapolis, he joined the DAV, applied for and got a broadcasting job within seven days. Some of you will remember Stuart A. Lindman on the radio, especially his long career on television. He became involved with many veterans and charitable organizations, which brought him in contact with many prominent local, national, military, and international leaders and celebrities. For 12 years, he was a Minnesota civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army. After I interviewed him in his den in 2005, he decided to donate his uniform and many documents, plaques, and awards to the Minnesota Military Museum, where I was curator. Pointing to the wall behind me, he said, there's one thing I'm going to keep, because it's the very most important thing to me. On the wall, he had his medals, Bronze Star, Purple Heart, campaign medals neatly framed, his most treasured mementos. <laughs> Gee, I wish I could read it all, but we're running out of time. Um, uh, these oral histories are all available through the Minnesota Historical Society site online. Um, there's hundreds of them. Um, take a look for them. It's great reading. It's all first-person accounts. Um, Do we want to do some questions? Okay, I'm going to get in trouble. So, uh, who's got the mic for the questions? We got, uh, oh, side. you've got it there. Okay, any questions for our veteran, for our speaker? Oh, I'm coming down. Hey, John. Uh, you didn't, uh, my dad was in the, the 706th Tank Battalion attached to the 77th Infantry Division. And in 44, they, uh, their first invasion was Guam. You didn't talk about Guam. Is Guam in your book? Okay. Yeah, I have an, an entire chapter on, on Guam and uh, the 77th Division there. And uh, one of the things that stands out about it, um, in that case, the, uh, the 3rd Marine Division had gone in first and also the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade. Um, they are in ferocious fighting for that first seven days or so. The 77th Division comes in to help um, and is in you know, much of the rest of the battle. But one of the things, it, the cultural difference uh, between the two forces was really quite interesting. And what I mean by that to some extent, the age. The 77th Division guys were older than what the Marines had, had seen in combat. So they, they called them old buzzards. And uh, they called them it admiringly because they, they were amazed how the 77th Division was fighting as well as it was. And they said, look at old, those old buzzards go. You know, like when you're 19 or 20, anybody above 30 or above 25 seems ancient, you know. So it was like that. And so then by the end of the campaign, they were, they were honorary Marines. 
um, as they called them. And there was some very difficult fighting that took place towards the end of July and into August 1944, some tank battles. Um, so I, I have an entire chapter on that. And, and what I would argue is, is really quite striking is the, the strong relationship between uh, Major General Roy Geiger, the Marine Inf uh, Corps commander, and the Army's uh, commander of the 77th Infantry Division, A.D. Bruce. Uh, they knew each other, they were old friends, they had great respect for each other, and um, you, you really see the two services fight very well together. Um, I've got a late story to add to the program, mm -hmm. too. So my, my dad said uh, that... We, uh, we just need to go to the questions. Please. Okay. I'm sorry, yep. but yep. we're really running over and yep. we can't have the stories. Thanks. Okay, I'm just going to recognize the Army divisions that were there. 1st Cav, 6th Infantry, 7th Infantry, 11th Airborne, 24th Infantry, 25th Infantry, 27th Infantry, 31st Infantry, 32nd Infantry, Wisconsin National Guard, 33rd Infantry, um, 37th Infantry, 38th, 40th, 41st, 43rd, 77th, 81st, 93rd, 96th, 97th got there right at the end, went into the Philippines, and 98th. Who's ever heard of them? You know, mm. But all great stories. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Any other last questions? Oh, here we go. You guys are making me work today. Thank you. Question for John. John, intelligence uh, is God, uh, maybe the, is the king of the battlefield. Um, and uh, is there uh, any kind of uh, uh, perspective you can give us on what kind of intelligence the Army was using and, mm -hmm. and if the Navy was developing it via submarines, uh, sending guys ashore or not. And how did the Army get intelligence to make a difference? Yeah, so um, when I speak of the Army and its intel, I almost have to break it down into three parts. Um, you've got Stillwell operating in the China-Burma-India theater and, of course, by 1944, running that major campaign to open a supply line to China in the northern part of Burma, and of course the famous Merrill's Marauders, a deep penetration light infantry force going in there. Now their intel primarily comes from uh, local tribes people in northern Burma, the Kachin tribes. Uh, and here's what I mentioned earlier about the sort of special forces type of, of missions. Um, you are operating with them on a kind of advisory but also uh, sort of learning kind of basis. And the way you're learning is intel to a great extent. The other thing, too, um, and some of these guys I think were trained not far from here, Japanese Americans who were operating with not just Merrill's Marauders, but other units throughout the Pacific that were really a force multiplier in terms of gleaning uh, Japanese intentions, obviously interrogating the few POWs you got, but overhearing Japanese communications and figuring out something you know, that could help commanders. Now, the second component would be the Army divisions that are fighting under Nimitz. Now, in that case, uh, so like the 77th Division at Guam, uh, would be one example, the 7th Division at Kwajalein, whatever. So uh, you're getting your intel the same way the Marines are, the same way the Navy is. You're getting it through, so you had mentioned submarines, you're getting it through aerial recon, you're getting it through Coast Watcher reports that, that can be in play, but really it's, it's quite limited in, in some respects. Um, so um, that's where you kind of sometimes have to learn the hard way once you go in. Um, SWAPA. Uh, there is an enormous uh, intelligence infrastructure that MacArthur has by 1944, um, part of which is the Allied Translator and Interpreter section, uh, which are the people who are dealing with the, the code book and, um, and the translation of the Japanese diaries, working with Coast Watchers, working with Filipino guerrillas, um, working with obviously the Navy, with submarines, with aerial recon flights, both Navy and Army Air Forces. So if you are Charles Willoughby, uh, MacArthur's intel officer at G2, you have, you have all these baskets of intelligence that you are drawing from in SWAPA. Um, and that's why I, I kind of take him to task, honestly, in, in, uh, in all three of the books, because I feel with all the assets he's got, he probably should have come up with better estimates. It's really easy for me to say, but I think it's um, his, his um, overestimate and underestimate of various Japanese garrisons is really quite glaring at times. So for instance, the Luzon campaign that comes later in 1945, um, he's going to dramatically underestimate the, no, the number of Japanese there, and this really has a great bearing on how the battle will be fought. So the intel, it's, it's, uh, it's rich compared to what the Japanese have, but it's in the end something of a flawed animal too. We've got one question up here. Oh. I have one more. 
Uh, you, you mentioned one of the uh, generals uh, had spent time in Siberia. I know mm. two other writers, uh, Anthony Sutton, he wrote about our troops in Siberia and also uh, Frederick Manfred wrote about him, but exactly. Do you have, what, do you have, a, do you have what, a question? Or what did you say? Um, who was the officer that was in Siberia, and uh, hmm. what did you say that he was doing there? Yeah, so this is uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger, who at the time was uh, anywhere from like captain to lieutenant colonel when, when he's there. So he is the uh, the key intel officer for General Graves, who was the U.S. commander in what they called the Polar Bear Expedition. Uh, but he really does much more than just gathering intel. He's also leading operationally on the ground at times. And uh, this in tandem with really what Graves felt was outstanding work as an intel officer um, leads him to get the Distinguished Service Cross. He, uh, he'll get a cluster for that cross uh, later on in World War II for the Battle of Buna as well. But yeah, Eichel, so Eichelberger has a really interesting background on that side. And, and uh, last point on that, um, one of the things that's really quite useful for him much later on is that he had observed the Japanese firsthand at Siberia. And so he draws from that knowledge of, of Japanese operations and, and doctrine and all that. And he had, he had spent a little time embedded with the Japanese unit. And so I think that that's certainly helpful for him later in his career. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up. I'm sorry, but we just run out of time. Uh, John, before everybody gets up, you run upstairs and assume your position to sign your books. Everybody, yes, wait a minute now, go buy the book. He's going to sign it, I guarantee, in 50 years it'll be worth a fortune. Support for this program is provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org.